Hello to everyone who's joined us. My name is Lauren Elkin, and I am very, very happy to be in conversation with the artist Shotaba Biswas, hosted by the fabulous Yale Center for British Art online series, At Home Artists in Conversation. So I have a little bit of housekeeping to get through before we get into our conversation. Please note that this program is being recorded. Your camera and sound are muted and will remain so throughout the program. We will be using the Q&A feature located on your navigation bar to gather your questions for Shotapa, and they will be answered at the end of the program. So please feel free to answer, I mean, to submit us questions sort of as and when they arise, but then no, we will, we will set aside a block of time at the end of the program to answer them. I have a land acknowledgement to read. Yale University acknowledges that indigenous people and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoc, Golden Hill, Pagosset, Nahantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking people have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these people and nations and this land. And I am coming to you from Northern London, where we don't do land acknowledgements because nobody likes to talk about the fact that all this land is owned by very wealthy people and we just give them money. Um, about Shotapa. So Shotapa was born in Shantini Katan. I've already seen it written with the S and not with the H, so it's tripped me up. So Shantini Katan, West Bengal, India in 19, sorry, 1962. Biswas is a British Indian conceptual artist who works across painting, drawing, film, performance, and time-based media. Her art considers questions of gender, class, cultural, and ethnic identity, and she is particularly interested in how larger historical and personal narratives collide. Our conversation today will include a discussion about her visually stunning new film, Lumen 2021, which can be viewed on the center's website from February 15th to 21st. So just all this week. And I really, really strongly recommend you have a look at it if you haven't done so already. The film draws on her family's departure from India in the mid 1960s and creates a poetic reflection on the experience of migration and to the feelings of rupture, dislocation, longing and belonging. Biswas is exhibiting in two concurrent solo exhibitions at the Baltic Center for Contemporary Art in Gateshead near Newcastle and at Kettle's Yard, Cambridge, which just closed a couple of weeks ago. So Shatapa, I'm so excited that we're finally getting a chance to do this after months of, of anticipation. Um, <laughs> here we are. So we've been, you know, just to include everyone in our, our sort of thinking, we've been back and forth talking about what slides Shatapa should show, what kind of prongs of attack we should use to try to get into the, the meat of this film and all of the issues that it addresses and invites. So I think probably the best place to start is to just ask you how it came about, maybe for people who don't know your work as well, how is it situated in the kind of flow of your work and you know, what's the journey from you know, conception to the film that we see before us now? Um, thank you so much. Lauren for that wonderful introduction and um, I have been really excited about this for uh, as you have been for months and uh, in fact longer <laughs> so it's a real pleasure for me to be here to talk about my work and this work in particular um, Lumen with you Lauren so um, and maybe before I start to talk about the work, I would just like to thank the Yale Centre for British Art for all of the amazing support that they have given to me throughout the making of Lumen, and in particular during the period of time that I was involved in researching the subject matter and looking at the archives that went into making this work. And also to very briefly thank um, the various uh, organizations in the UK and elsewhere who have been extraordinary in helping me realize this work. So Film and Video Umbrella, Bristol Museums, uh, the Baltic Gateshead, Kettleshard Cambridge, the Art Fund, Autograph and Arts Council England, and of course my production team. Um, just to say in response to your question, to talk about this work by way of an introduction. In many senses, the work, I mean, the work began as an idea, as a concept several years ago. And if I think back to it, 
the basis of it began with this particular painting here by Vermeer. And the reason being that when I moved from India to the UK at the age of about five, this was in fact the first painting that I recall ever really experiencing, I think would be the right way of describing it. And I say that because the image stayed with me primarily because at around the time that I saw this image by Vermeer, painted circa 1663, it's his painting of woman reading a letter. In a London context, I had such a vivid experience of seeing my mother three quarters turned away from me, looking out towards the window, reading, you know, letters from home on blue aerogram paper. And on one occasion, I recall that she was wearing this particular sari, which is a very, very fine silk sari. So what we're looking at here as an image is in fact production still from Lumen. And you're seeing here my actress, Natasha Patel, who plays the main female character in my work, Lumen. And it felt very important for me that in this particular scene that she should wear one of, the, well, the very sorry that I remember my mother wearing as a child, as in fact, I encountered this, you know, and recalled this painting by Vermeer. And it really wasn't until several decades later, or several years later, when I was an art student at the University of Leeds studying fine art with art history, in 1981, that I came back to looking at this painting by Vermeer and to really begin to consider the symbolism and the kinds of motifs that he was using. So for example, here we see, you know, quite a wonderful use of blue, which I presume is from lapis, which would have been mined in the northern parts of, of India and in Afghanistan. But also in, in the rear behind her, what we see as she's reading the letter is a very early painting of a map. And this was painted around the time of the expansion of the Dutch East India Empire. So it really made me think very deeply about the journey of my mother to the UK. And in order to do that, I felt that Lumen as a work is a semi-fictional piece that explores the story of my mother's journey and my grandmother's journey and my own journey from their place of birth, which at the time was part of British India, and which subsequent to partition became East Pakistan, and then subsequently around the 1970s became Bangladesh. And then her departure from India, if you like, which was prompted by my father's political views and his differences with Congress at the time. So, he was in a way um, forced to a situation whereby he had to leave India rather hurriedly and not really through desire, I would say. So Lumen as a work charts this story, but I think told through a feminist lens, you know, through my own eyes, through my own voice. So it is the story of these three women intricately bound together. And as we see the story, the narrative unfold, it draws upon archival source material and imagery that are taken from historical works that were made in around 1765, right through to the period of the British Raj and to the contemporary kind of context. What I haven't said is really something about the title. And the title for me 
was really important in the sense that lumen is the name of a unit of light. You know, it's a gradient of radiance, but it's also an anatomical term for a bodily cavity or conduit, such as, for example, an artery or a vessel along which blood flows. So for me, as a work, these two meanings converged in a way that allowed me to really explore the complexity of this journey, but somehow situating that path within the context of both the body and also the notion of a unit of light and what that means in the context of measuring and framing things. I suppose that one of the things that was really important in making the work, which is filmed in both, the contemporary footage is filmed in both all along the west coast of India and also at a place called Red Lodge in Bristol in the UK, which is in fact a heritage site. It's now a museum, but it saw its foundation in the Tudor period, which was hugely important in the sense that this was a time during which free market economy, if you like, was established through the monarchy in, in the UK. And so this particular building seemed to, as an interior space, because we can see from, from this, this is a production still, that it somehow mimics in its design or suggests something that looks a little bit like a Dutch interior. And so, and then of course, you can see here on the right hand side of the image, a portrait of Queen Elizabeth I. So all of these components came together in my work, I think formally and aesthetically, in a way that I hoped would allow those timeframes, you know, the period of you know, the 1600s and the expansion of the Dutch East India Company, then moving into something that were, became the British East India Company, and then subsequently became part of the British Raj in colonial, British colonial India. And it feels to me that this is the story that, although it's of my mom at this particular moment in time where she's leaving India, you know, I'm trying to trace this matrilineal journey. The basis of this is something that is, in fact, hundreds of years old. And that's really the starting point for it. Yeah. Um, there's so much that I want to ask you about in, in what you've just said, but I... I really love this film and, and as I told you, I'm, I feel very moved to write about it in, in this weird way. I'm sitting here reflecting on like my job as a writer, as a person who writes about art. I feel like it's to describe the work for people who haven't seen it. And so that's what I'm, you know, have in mind for people in the audience who maybe haven't watched it, but also to help people who have seen it engage with it further. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to do as I listen to you and as I think about what I want to ask you to like open up the film a bit, but what you were just saying about the lumen as an artery, I find so rich and suggestive precisely because, I mean, on one hand, there's a real sense in the film, and this is, as you've told me, very purposeful, a sense of movement of being kind of on the waves and the pace of the film is very deliberately kind of structured to create this feeling of being moved through like as if one were on a boat and there's a lot of, you know, obviously maritime imagery in the film. That moment in the Tudor Lodge that you were just showing, I thought you were going to say that paneling reminded you of the interior of a boat. I was thinking for a second, you know, it does look like the inside of what I imagine a Tudor boat would have looked like, you know, not a boat, like a big ship, like, you know, to fight the Spanish Armada with or ferry a queen to some other country on. But I really wanted to ask you, I had a mentor in graduate school who firmly believed that our political commitments as scholars begin in the archive, or if not begin there, are a constant kind of going back to it. And certainly as feminist scholars and, and 
writers, that is a very big aspect of what she taught me. And I know that a lot of the research for this film took place in the archive at the Yale Center for British Art. And so you, all of what you were just saying about the luminous and artery and thinking about this movement, I'm just thinking about the archive is not this kind of dry, dusty repository where like paper goes to die, but actually is maybe something in stasis temporarily that's waiting to be brought out and then restored to some kind of movement between, you know, times in history or different creators or different readers or people who view art. I don't know. That's just a lot of different things that came to me out of what you were just saying. I wonder if you want to tell us a bit about the research you undertook in the archive and you know what your thoughts are on on archival research and art mm, absolutely and if i could just maybe come to that slightly from a tangent but just to say that you know the starting point for me was thinking back to you know the broad spectrum of oral narratives that i had heard being talked about in the context of our family home as a young young girl growing up, but also from the context of things that I read snippets of. And so constructing the, the film really came through those two sorts of avenues, if you like, imagining what my mother felt like at this particular point in her life when she had to leave everything that was home. You know, I've already mentioned that she grew up in British India. And so she and my father and, you know, their family were educated in English. And indeed, I grew up with stories whereby I was told that they were forbidden from speaking in their own mother tongue growing up. And so, you know, the kinds of literature that they were exposed to, for example, was Shakespeare, you know, the English poets, the English writers, etc. And so thinking about the archive was something that automatically, in a way, came to me. And it was a kind of attempt to try to see how much of what was shared with me in terms of that oral history, if you like, that those oral narratives from family, and how that sat or rested with the kind of archival material that I was then able to discover from my, um, when I was a fellow at the Yale Center for British Art in 2019. And one of the things that I discovered, which was really quite extraordinary. I mean, I went back there, you know, I wanted to go back there because I had been an Andrew W. Mellon fellow in 2008, invited by Yale and also the, the Yale Center for British Art. And I remember coming across this extraordinary archive of visual imagery, you know, travelogues, etc., from the period of the high colonial period of the British in India. And so I went back with that sort of sense of wanting to find out more, wanting to sort of tie together things that I'd heard, you know, in my family, things that I'd heard from my father talk about, for example, and he was an academic. So, you know, he had a very kind of particular way of sharing information and knowledge. So going back to be a fellow at the Yale Center for Contemporary Art, what I discovered was the archive of the artist, somebody called James Forbes, who in 1765 traveled from London, from England, to Bombay, to in fact work for the British East India Company. And it just really struck a chord with me because his journey in some respects, although, you know, it was slightly more convoluted in terms of the fact that the vessel that he was traveling on, the ship he was traveling on, sprung a leak, so there was a detour, etc. But nevertheless, I was really drawn to this story, you know, that he was traveling in the opposite direction to my mother. And he was traveling to India to make his fortune. So 
these images that this one is actually included in Lumen um, became part of something that was really important to informing the kind of thinking underlying themes within the work. And of course, his role, James Forbes' role in part, was to document a variety of flora and fauna, the characteristics of the Indian subjects in different parts of India, you know, what the characteristics were. And so his job in a way, as somebody who worked for this mercenary company, was to log details of the nature of the produce here we have peppers, for example, you know, but there were images of grain, wheat, what kind of wheat produced the largest yield, what kind of wheat produced the poorest yield, you know, and where this might be that, you know, the, the higher yielding wheat, where that would be then shipped to, you know, what was taxed. So it really knitted into this very complicated history about the British colonial occupation in India. And all of that was really prompted by those two things. You know, the, first of all, the Vermeer's painting and that sense of, you know, the Dutch expansion, but also then, you know, the Dutch, you know, the Portuguese came before the Dutch, the Spanish, the French, the British. So this was a time of great market expansion, but really a kind of piracy that existed. And the more I delved into the archive, the more I felt that there is so much about this archive and about this history that is still really not talked about in the broader context of how histories are shared, how they're talked, uh, how they're taught rather, more generally within the context either of art history courses, but more broadly within the context of you know, school and the education system. So the work felt really important to me in terms of, you know, using that archive, really, here we've got an image of, you know, it says Bombay from Malabar Point, it's painted in 1803. And then how that begins to also within the context of the film, move into the archival film footage from Bristol archives of the British Raj in India. And I think that, you know, this is very important to talk about because I think that, you know, one of the things I began to discover were all kinds of facts, for example, you know, that slave markets existed in India. You know, this is something that Titus Chakrapati writes about in a really beautiful article and essay that she's written. Um, you know, actual slave markets, existed in India, where Indian subjects were bought and sold, but also where the slave markets also supported the sale of subjects from right across the Indian Ocean world, you know, from East Asia, from Polynesia, from different parts of the world, you know, from Africa. So these are histories that quietly and subliminally interface with what I felt had resulted in the lives that my parents experienced as growing up in India, but also as adults to the point where they were then forced to, to leave India for those kinds of reasons. Um, yeah. So using the archive at Yale and bringing those pictures into that imagery, into the body of Lumen in a way that I feel was poetic. And through the monologue, you know, really, I mean, it was quite hard to write in the sense that I had to imagine that space, but also the delivery of it, which I was very particular in wanting it to be spoken almost in a Shakespearean way, you know, to have that kind of structure to it really, and to have that sort of have that sort of presence, that flowing in and out. And I think you're absolutely right that the formal and aesthetic aspect parts of this film 
are edited, you know, through the sound design, through the imagery, through the archival material to constantly make the viewer feel, I think, as if they are traveling on the crest of a wave that's sort of moving up and down all the time. I hope it's really, it. yeah, yeah, no, completely. I, I just building on that, it's really that aspect of the film that's, I think, what makes it so persuasive as a document as a work of art that it's not it's like a total work of art it's not just you know an artist doing some video it really I mean for people who haven't seen the film there's this kind of monologue given by Natasha Patel who's the actress that underpins the whole film and you know the bits of footage and, and archival material are kind of woven into her addressed to camera basically and so you Shatipa, are working really as a director you know not just as a, a visual artist who works in film as a medium but you know you're making a kind of you know it's almost like a feature film just you know it's only a half hour long only a half hour and so on every level the production values are working knitting together to create a very specific kind of aesthetic and political you know, the two are intertwined experience. And the text, I mean, just as a writer is <laughs> like really one of my favorite things about the film. And it's astonishing in its kind of, in the ambiguity of voice, the fact that there's kind of three generations, like you, your mother and your grandmother, it, you can kind of tell who's speaking when, but it's also a bit blurry, maybe purposefully blurry. And it, you just have this kind of tremendously effective and witty and biting and like loving female narrative of trauma basically, and of family and of migration and of yearning. And it feels kind of collective, even though it's spoken in the eye. And as I was saying to you the other day, for me, it feels maybe kind of like an oblique self-portrait. There's that moment where the narrator says, dark space, where can you take me now? And I love that. It just, it sends chills down my spine, just thinking about you as an artist, kind of opening yourself to this subject and this material, like where, where can you take me, guide me, you know, O oh muse. So yeah, I know that's a lot. I just wonder how you approached that sort of aspect, the writing aspect or the kind of narrative aspect of the film? I mean, I think that, it, it, you know, it's it was so strange because, I mean, the film begins, you know, with this moment, you know, from the minute that child was born, she was petulant, eyes forever wandering and restless like a feral cat, never following the finger or taking a nipple when it was time, but choosing to mark her own rhythms in the day. She couldn't have known, could she? Could she have known as she gulped her first breaths? So that tiny brown creature that pushed itself out from my own. And in a way I felt that, I mean, I, I, I think I almost went into a trance-like state as I was writing it. And I seemed to disappear into this rabbit hole, you know, into this underworld almost where I had to imagine myself as somebody else. And as I was imagining that I was the voice of my mother, I was also imagining that, in other words, trying to think what my mother felt. And at the same time that, you know, I was imagining what my mother must have felt as she, you know, was giving birth, you know, to me. I was also trying to imagine where she was in terms of what perhaps she thought thought about her own birth and in in that moment of trying to chart this maternal lineage you know I was very keen to just keep coming back and forth as if whoever was speaking as if my main character was speaking out about somebody else, but also speaking about himself. And I think that in a, in a strange sort of way, that as a device allowed me then to move between the characterizations, the, the three voices. And indeed Crow, you know, who's a very strong presence, is also a muse. And a fourth voice 
And at some places, I think it's hard to know whether, you know, the, the mother is the crow or the child is the crow. So it feels as if there is this kind of very interesting battle going on between those spaces. You know, it's, it's a psychological kind of, it's deeply psychological. And I think that for me, that was very deliberate because I felt that in order to really somehow immerse myself in how it felt to be a mother and how it feels to be a mother, how it feels to leave the place that you love in terms of India, you know, or for my grandmother and my mother, they had to leave what was British India and then became something else, you know, moved to West Bengal. What happens when you lose your gravitational and your latitudinal and longitudinal frames of reference? You know, what happens when the landscape changes? You know, where does that take you? And so dark space, where can you take me next? Felt like it was this recurring line that was the place of knowing great discomfort was the inevitable consequence of that journey. But also a sense of taunting oneself, I think, you know, psychologically with this sense of, okay, where are you going to take me next? And I think that, you know, as a device, it allowed me through language, through the various parts of the monologue, and that certainly is a very sharp moment in, in that, poignant moment in that, a kind of recurrent sort of like the way, you know, something that keeps coming back. It felt to me that that was really key to allowing this kind of, state of almost madness actually that you you know because our character moves from a space of feeling comfort she's remembering what it was like to be a child she's remembering what it was and as soon as she does that she's kind of confronted with history a history of violence and then shocked into this space of remembering how this history of violence then places her somewhere that's deeply uncomfortable. And so that, that kind of thematic rolling of dark space, where can you take me next? I think to an extent is about that returning to the trauma of violence, but also to an extent painting with light outwards to this space, to this because Lumen, of course, we associate with the moon, you know, this kind of cosmological space and galaxy that's beyond, you know, something that draws her beyond her ability to control. And that is really a reference to, to history in that it is through them. We can't change history, but we can understand the present by looking back and being drawn to that space, trying to understand how history has charted us, how it frames us. And so for me, in terms of allowing that mapping, that navigational presence to really come in and out of that space through this reference to water and the sea, and you know the waves, if you like, through the kind of sense of editing and this, you know, I mean, through this visceral motion that I think begins to occupy the body somehow and the mind, felt really important in underlining that question. You know, dark space. Where can you take me to next? Mm. Because I kept trying to think how terrified my mother must have been, you know, traveling to England completely, you know, just with five children, all under the age of 10. I mean, they went through the Suez Canal, you know, we were on one of the last passenger ships to go through the Suez Canal, but to leave Bombay, travel through the Suez Canal, 
you know, then to Naples, from which point you would, you know, take a train, overground train to France, to Calais, and then a boat from Calais to London. I mean, though, you know, even that as a concept for me is still quite overwhelming. But it is something about the loss of what, where is that voice? Where are the voices of those female experiences? Because they seem so often overshadowed by the male story. And dark space is also a kind of womb-like space. It's the space from which the child emerges, you know, the petulant child that won't take the nipple, you know, who's feral. So there are constantly these kind of moments of friction. And I think that that, for me, is really important to it. What we're looking at here is a detail from the Red Lodge in you know, this Tudor Great Hall. And what you're seeing here mm. is in fact a device that stops you know, a slave from speaking, basically. So it's in the way that the stories that I heard when I was growing up you know, about the violence and the rape of Indian subjects by, by members of the British Raj and what it meant to be a maid or a servant who had to work, who, who was the servant of a wealthy master, as in Lumen, you know, we see, we see those characters come in the frame. And so, you know, the marbles in the mouth is again, a kind of reference to the painful nature of holding anger and holding violence or holding that, that moment where the body is violenced or violated. And yet the marble is going into the mouth, which is you know, the orifice, which is a space where then you re-enter that, the lumen, the arteries, basically. So it was a phrase through which I could really make those connections between the here and the there, the now and the past, the future and the present. And I think for me that, that really worked. I was very nervous of what my mother would say. You know, what did she say? Finally came to see the film at Kettle Jard and not that long ago with my sister and husband took her to, to see it. And I think she really loved it. I haven't had an opportunity to really sit down with her and, you know, have an in-depth, in but I suspect that she would have been quite emotional. But I tested it out. When I finished writing the monologue, I, again, was quite nervous and I tested it, you know, I sent it at that stage when it was completed to my sister. And by this point, you know, so much of the archival material from Yale and from the uh, Bristol film archives were already coming together, and my storyboard, but I sent it to my younger sister and she really loved it. And she said it was beautiful and poetic. And I was really looking for that. I wanted to create something that was not a documentary, but that it had a very poetic sensibility and narrative. And that textually these visuals were moving in between the archive and you know history of the past and the present here you see a moment from the, um, of the British military who were huge you know in terms of that time frame of the British Raj in, in India and then you know coming back to the Delft tiles basically and there are those two Delft tiles, as you know, at Kettle Jar, which was also a kind of triggering moment for me in terms of thinking about the Dutch history and going back to Vermeer's painting. So I really wanted through the film to introduce these kind of aesthetic 
and formal presences that then were very much interwoven with something that, you know, is fictional, but drew from, from those things. What I didn't mention in terms of slaves and ayahs and, you know, the stories that you hear through slatted doors, those stories were compounded when I discovered at Yale archival material that looked as if, you know, those kinds of exchanges, watercolors in which paintings, in which it looks as if those kinds of exchanges are taking place. So there are these various frames of reference. This is the music room. I know we're kind of running short on time, but the music room, it's a still from Suthajit Rai's um, The Music Room, and which was again, a really important presence for me in terms of, you know, the narrative that exists in there. I forget exactly the, when it was made, I think it was 1957. And then how that's recreated in the context of, of Lumen. So drawing not only archival material from 1765 and further in terms of the reference to the mirror and my mother's blue sari that my actress is wearing, but also painting with light, you know, re creating these spaces through the visuals that constantly sort of move back and forth in very sort of uncomfortable ways. Again, this is from Forbes's own watercolors of the very early watercolors of nomadic circus performers. But this moment was something that in itself refers back to a film by Bellini called La Strada, The Road from 1954. But also there are moments in this work here that make reference to Satyajit Rai's Pate Panchali, which is the song of the Little Road. And we know that Satyajit Rai was inspired by Fellini's works. So texturally and formally and aesthetically, and in terms of the, the nature of the art history that comes in and out of my work here, is something that was very important. And of course, it's not new. You know, this is really an approach that I have right throughout my work from, as you know, from Carly, the work that's in Tate's collection, the video piece that's in Tate's collection and Housewives with Steak Knives, you know, Birdsong. So yeah, so just kind of going through these images of, you know, dark space, where can you take them next? That sense I'm just gonna break in for one second because the dark space is swallowing me. I'm gonna turn a light on, but you continue to talk. I'll just be right. <laughs> okay, yeah. So. This sense of the dark space, you know, this fear, you know, this foreboding, which comes through. And I think that that is part of the lyricism, albeit disturbing, that really carries you in a way through the film. Yeah. We have some questions from the audience, so maybe this is a good point at which to open it up. And we have two different questions about the use of the mirror as a device in the film and why it's, you know, why you keep coming back to it as a point to moments of reflection, conflicting thoughts, some other duality. Yeah, it's that's a really great question. Thank you. Um, I mean, on a practical level, <laughs> straight up, part of the film was shot. All of the footage in, at Red Lodge was shot during the pandemic. And I had to move from two actresses to one. So I had to think very quickly on my feet as to how to create space for these, the existence of these other characters. And the mirror became a really straightforward device, if you like, through which I could achieve that. And there is a duality, you know, there is this sense of mirroring and it does not indeed go back to, Lacan's writing about the mirror stage and the imaginary order. I guess that for me, it is, you know, Lacan revisited his ideas about the mirror stage in psycho within psychoanalytic theory. And he began to feel that he no longer considered the mirror stage from the 1950s as a moment in the life of an infant as you know the point at which the infant 
begins to identify itself you know, as other and self, if you like, but rather as representing a permanent structure of subjectivity or as a paradigm of the imaginary order. So this evolution of Lacan's thinking becomes clear in his later essay called The Subversion of the Subject and the Dialectic of Desire. And so for me, if I think back to not only the practicality of using the mirror, but also thinking about how the mirror as a formal device allows this sense of us to engage and creates this space for subjectivity, for desire, to begin to kind of open up and speak really. So um, yeah, there is the, the mirroring of, it is, I think you, you asked that question, is it an oblique self-portrait? And I think that the mirror can, becomes a device through which that can happen. It was inspired by the mirrors in Versailles Palace, you know, in the great ballroom and thinking about, about that space and about the meaning of watching yourself move through space, you know, in time, you know, through the reflection of oneself. We have a question from Nancy Ann Miller, who says, I traveled by ship from Bermuda to the States when my family moved to America. Your thoughts are making me realize how fortuitous it was for me to travel by boat and to be rocked and possibly soothed by the ocean on the way. Might you talk a bit about migration and traveling to a new land by boat? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I was only four, you know, if that at the time. And I think that the circular space that we see here, you know, the two mirrors that are resting on an easel. One is a, an antique easel, the other is a more contemporary easel. I think that one of the lasting impressions I have of that journey is looking out of the portal and looking into this dark space, basically. And I know that my mother was incredibly seasick at the time and um, <laughs> there's a story that on April Fool's Day, you know, the kind of drill went off and it was a joke. And of course, you know, my siblings were like, mum, you have to come up on board and this is going on. And, and I'm paraphrasing here, but I think that she said like something like, it doesn't matter if I drown, I drown, you know, somebody else will deal with you someone else will look after you <laughs> and so I remember that she was very nervous I was so small my younger sister was tiny as well that she kept us very close to her at the time because she was so afraid of us falling overboard actually and so some of the imagery is in fact from archival footage of the Suez Canal for example so I think that it felt important to me to create this sense of claustrophobia, really. You know, this sense of being tied into this round space I'm making, this portal, this mirror, this galaxy beyond that space. So I don't know that I can compare it exactly to the person journey who's asked the question, but it's certainly something that deeply remains it's left an indelible mark really in my mind's eye and I think that when I came to looking at that archival material in Suez Canal and the Laskers for example play, played a very important part in the trade routes of course that it just seemed to prompt something in my mind's eye of the conversations that my brothers and sisters had about seeing what they saw as they traveled through the Suez Canal. We have maybe time for one more question from Dreek Zorinsky, who asks, it is so striking to me that so many artists and also writers are uncovering the ghosts of history as you are. Do you think this is something unique to this moment in history or does it have a longer history in art? 
That's a really good question. And that's a tough question. I think it has a very long history, certainly in filmmaking. And filmmaking, by comparison, is, is relatively recent for obvious reasons. I think that it is important to the contemporary moment because we are questioning where we are as collective communities at this moment in history and time and trying to make sense of it. And so I can only really talk about myself in this context. I think I've always been interested in histories because for my parents, it was so much part of their life. And it was so much part of the conversations that we had and we experienced and encountered growing up as children. And then studying art history, you know, feeling that, you know, when I looked at Turner's The Slave Ship, for example, I was really asking at that time in 1981, in a department where the TJ Clark, the art, world-renowned art historian had established, you know, and I was tutored by Griselda Pollock and Fred Orton, and some amazing, you know, Mary Kelly, some amazing people, but I was really struck by the extent to which I was so absorbed in thinking about arts histories and wanting to ask questions about what was not being told. And so maybe in the contemporary moment, that is also what's being talked about. In terms of whether other artists have referenced it is historically, I think that there is always a sense of artists looking back to imagery and symbolism and motifs that give you a sense of space and time and history in terms of trying to understand that moment in time, for example, in the work of Bruegel, um, by looking at ways of painting and representing narratives that also are immersed in particular kinds of trajectories of painting. Perspectival painting changed the way in which we understood time and space. And so using that as a device to represent space and dimension and time is certainly something that has a, a trajectory that goes back to the Renaissance period. So to that extent, I would say yes. I'm going to try to fit in one more because there's, I mean, these questions are amazing. Thank you all so much for sending them. I'm making a copy of all of this to send to Shatipa because um, I don't know if, if when you sign off of Zoom, the questions go away. But there's one last question that I'd like to ask you from Jane Trowell, who says, you placed an Indian female figure into an Elizabethan stately home. And to me, visually, she both owned the space and was overwhelmed by the heavy oak paneling of the space. She felt like a dream or a haunting of the space, as well as an impossibility. Can you say something about how it felt to be occupying this space built on the back of colonial merchant adventuring? Yeah, that's a great question, Jane. And thank you for it. It is really complicated going back into these histories. And I know that when I came back from Yale, for example, that I was actually traumatized for a while, <laughs> you know, because of the discovery of the violence and the extent of the violence. Mm. But in relation to this space in Bristol at Red Lodge, it has an extraordinary history. You know, the wealth of it is built on the exploitation of, you know, the mercenary exploitation of slave histories right across the world, you know, the spice trade, the cotton trade, you name it, you know, it's all interrelated. So when we were rehearsing, I was rehearsing with Natasha, my actor who's here in this still image. We did most of that originally online because of the pandemic. 
And, you know, we went through a kind of course, you know, the voice, the this, the that. And then we met in person on the premises of Film Video Umbrella, who were the executive producers on the film. And I was there with Teddy Testar, who is my cinematographer, marvellous, wonderful person to work with. And, you know, we went through the motions, we planned the shots, all of that kind of thing. Everything was really rigorous and it had to be. For me, I like working that way as a filmmaker, that sort of rigor. But it was interesting because Natasha actually, after Teddy had left for the rehearsal, Natasha and I continued. And also the choreographer, who was brilliant and so lovely to work with. After they had left, Natasha and I were left in the space and she wanted to understand more of the journey of my parents. And because her own parents, I believe, were born in the UK, as indeed she was. And I asked her how, how old she was, how old Natasha was. She said, I'm 32. And I said, well, imagine, you know, my mother was 28 when she came here. And I then talked about the history of the building and said, when you are there, Natasha, you will feel that space differently. You will, I suspect, be so immersed in that space. Because we had been rehearsing so much, you know, there is something most likely that you may experience close to, to trauma. And I think being in a space like that, you can't fail to understand how much wealth went into the building of that building and where that wealth came from. So during the course of the filming, of course, we were dealing with pandemic times still. So there were very rigorous guidelines in terms of contact and all of that sort of thing. And there were two moments in that filming where my actor actually cried because I believe she was really overwhelmed by precisely what Jane, you've asked. And interestingly, one of those moments happened when she's lying on the floor surrounded by the pomegranates and the apples. And the pomegranates and the apples are also what you can see represented in the ceiling rows above her in this great Tudor banqueting hall. And as, as the cinematographer Teddy shifts focus from her face in the foreground to her reflection in the mirror, it was a really extraordinary moment because that was a real tear that you can see just rolling down. And I think that that really summarizes what it felt like and how it was an extraordinary experience filming in there. And I was so, so lucky because my production team were phenomenal and I love them all, you know, they were just incredible. And we had to work so rigorously as a team very quickly, but, I think just being in that space at that moment with that monologue, with the acting, with this kind of knowledge of what else might feed into the film was a very emotional thing. And I think it was very deeply felt. The historian Marcus Redeker, who's brilliant, also mentioned when I went to a lecture that he gave some time ago, in, I think it was at Birkbeck actually, and he said, it's somebody asked him a similar question, you know, how did it feel to, you know, to be going through this material? He's an historian, he, you know, this, this sort of um, transatlantic slave trade is often some, one of the key things that he, he writes of, about. And he said, well, you know, it was traumatizing. And I think there's so much truth in that because when you revisit the violence of it, it's hard to escape how traumatic it was. And then when you are, when you leave that moment, you come back to the now in trying to somehow pick up the pieces and they're not comfortable pieces. 
they are hard. You know, they are because they are hard pieces to have to pick up. And not everyone is willing to do that. But I think it's necessary. And more than necessary at this particular moment in history and time and space. <laughs> Dark space, where can you take us next? Oh, <laughs> uh, Shatipa, thank you so much. This has been wonderful for me personally. And um, I'm guessing from the questions that I was seeing really, really meaningful to everyone who's been tuning in. So thank you for your wonderful film, but also your very thoughtful answers and reflections tonight. I have a little bit more housekeeping before we sign off. I want to thank the Center for having both of us and invite the audience to join the Center next week at its next online program, which is a conversation on Friday, February 25th, 12 p.m. Eastern time, like today, with the artist, filmmaker, and production designer, Billy Gerard Frank and Thomas Allen Harris, senior lecturer, Yale Film and Media Studies and African American Studies. So that sounds fascinating. And yeah, I guess this is where we, yeah. we bid everyone adieu and till very I soon, I hope. Yeah, can yeah. I say thank you to you for being such a marvelous, wonderful host. And My I pleasure. It's, it's been so terrific to spend time talking with you about the film. Same, same. To your Much more talking about the film to come and other things. <laughs> I took so many notes. Yeah, and thank you so much to the audience who've joined us today, uh, to the viewers who've joined us, and also for the many questions. And of course, huge, huge thanks to the Yale Center for British Art at Yale University and all of those incredible people who've been amazing to work with. Thank you so much. <laughs>